Hi and welcome to No Second Season and thank you for joining me today. This video is a bit of a compilation of four True Life National Park disappearances in Australia. The first one is going to be one I haven't covered before and why I want to cover this one is because I feel it is so pertinent to Neil's, Celine and Damien's stories and to why Perhaps I speculate that they were never found. So I'll tell you the story and you see what you think. Story one, Rory Lane. It was Saturday, the 17th of June, 2023, only last year, that Rory Lane and a friend whose name I don't know set off hiking in the Lamington National Park in the Gold Coast hinterland in Queensland, Australia. The trail they were taking in the Lamington National Park was called the West Conundra Creek Circuit. They hiked all day and then for some reason at around quarter to five and I've no idea why, I can't find out why, but Rory and his friend were separated. His friend returned to the car that evening, but Rory didn't. Had they had a falling out? Had they had a fight? Or had what befell Rory happened to him at that point? But if it had, wouldn't friends who have been hiking together all day call out to each other to see <laughs> where the other one had gone? Very strange. I can't find anything on the internet to tell the true story of why it happened, why they got separated. Anyway, Rory's friend contacted the authorities and reported Rory missing. And the search started that evening. The temperatures were frigid and they were due to be around zero degrees. So it'd be quite important to find Rory as soon as possible. Alas, that wasn't to be that Saturday night. As the guys were on a day hike, they wouldn't be carrying a whole lot of water and food and clothing and shelter. And Rory was known to not be carrying a mobile phone. Possibly there was no signal in the area, but um, I think I'd carry one anyway, just for GPS, if nothing else. But he wasn't carrying one. So the 26 year old Brisbane man was out in the Lamington National Park that Saturday night. On the Sunday, the Queensland Police, the State Emergency Service, the Queensland Fire and Rescue still couldn't find him. And so he would have to spend another night, the Sunday night, in the frigid temperatures in the bush again. Monday morning, the search and rescue stepped up a notch because there was bad weather coming in on the Wednesday, so it was really important to find Rory as soon as possible. But still, he wasn't to be found by search and rescue, but by an absolute stroke of luck, some other hikers spotted him down in a creek bed. The embankment that Rory had fallen down was very steep and it had dense bush canopy, which actually hindered the airlifting of Rory out of that canyon. Rory was airlifted out of the canyon and airlifted to hospital. He's said to have been in a critical condition, in and out of consciousness, with abrasions, lacerations, suspected broken bones, but worst of all, was hypothermic. Possibly he wouldn't have lasted that Monday night. So what a stroke of luck those hikers found him. They absolutely saved his life and how good it is to have a happy ending. It just turns it around, doesn't it? All these other ones I've covered, no happy endings. So glad for Rory. His family was said to be overjoyed. Of course they were, and I'm sure Rory was too. But what happened there, why he got separated, how he fell, it's all a bit of a mystery. I can't find any information on it but I'm sure there is a story out there somewhere. So that's the very short story of the disappearance and reappearance of Rory Lane. And what a fantastic feeling it is that he was found alive, not quite well, 
that he's made a full recovery and hopefully he'll be back out hiking, perhaps be a little bit more careful and perhaps carry a personal locator beacon, although he may have had one and he may have been separated from it. And this is my biggest worry with personal locator beacons is that they stay with you when you have your mishap. Because if you fall down an embankment, as Rory did, your backpack can come off. And if your PLB is in it or on it, you've lost it. Um, so I find it a big worry. And so I'm really trying to find something where my PLB will always be on me. We don't know if Rory had one or not. Anyway, I digress. That is the story of Rory Lane and a happy ending. To Celine, Damien and Neil's story. Could they have fallen down an embankment or a cliff and just be hidden by the dense bush canopy? I wonder. So let's get on and listen to the other disappearance stories. Story two, Niels Becker. So today I have another true life disappearance story for you. It happened here in the Alpine National Park where I am now in Australia's high country. It was the 24th of October 2019 when 38 year old Niels Becker from Melbourne set off to spend his 39th birthday hiking in the Mount Buller region of the high country. The high country was special to Niels, it's said, because it gave him inspiration for his prose, poetry and music that he liked to write about the region. Although an experienced hiker, Niels wasn't taking this planned hike lightly. He'd even taken to hiking around Melbourne with a very heavy backpack on to simulate the weight he'd be carrying and to prepare his already fit body for his quest. His parents reported that he was a strong, fit and resilient hiker and was feeling on top of the world before he set off. He was well prepared for the hike. He had ample camping gear and plenty of supplies and his parents said he also took his skiing equipment with him. Although October is well into springtime in Australia, he was clearly expecting there to still be snow high up. Niels had borrowed a telephone from his mother and it said to be an old phone and therefore wouldn't hold charge for very long until it needed another charge. He made his way in his car from Melbourne to the Upper Jameson Hut, somewhere that is over 40 kilometres into the National Park, accessible only by 4 before track. Niels messaged his parents whilst he was at the Upper Jameson Hut and he was planning to hike in an anti-clockwise loop, returning there on the 29th of October. That would be the following Tuesday. Niels hadn't divulged his exact route to anyone, although it is said he reported his plans to the Mansfield police before he started his hike. And it's believed he was to start his hike by following the Australian Alps walking track. The AAWT, as it's known, is a 687 kilometre long hiking route across the Australian Alps, which is all part of the Great Dividing Range, which runs north to south along the eastern side of Australia. The Australian Alps are over 3 million acres of mountainous, semi-wilderness bushland. Neil's plan was to hike from the Jameson Hut, with his next stop being the Vallejo Gantner Hut, some 35 kilometres away. I speculate only here. He left the Jameson Hut sometime perhaps in the afternoon, hiked until around 6.30 with the sun setting around 7.30. He camped along that route to the Vallejo Gantner Hut, then continued on arriving there later on the Friday. That's the 25th of October, his 39th birthday. The next time he was heard from was Saturday the 26th of October, messaging his parents from the Vallejo Gantner Hut 
So whether he'd just arrived there or he'd slept the night, I speculate he had slept the night there. He told his parents in that message that he was going to walk on the AAWT a short while and then divert off towards Mount Stirling. After that message, Niels has never been heard from again, nor seen. No one knows what's happened to Niels from that very day, Saturday the 26th of October. He told his parents in that message that the phone signal wasn't very good and that he wouldn't contact them again until he arrived at Mount Buller. And that was going to be after Mount Sterling, I suppose. I only speculate. Um, but that would be a day or two after the 26th. Looking at weather conditions around that time in 2019, Niels would have been experiencing some beautifully starry night skies as they were mostly clear. But those clear skies would be bringing some frigid temperatures at the elevations Niels was hiking at, around 1500 metres. And he was not only hiking at them, but he was camping at them too. As far as I can see, Niels could have taken one of two routes to get to Mount Sterling, if that's where he was going next. One is a 21 kilometer Stanley's name spur walking track that looks quite exposed at some points. And the second one is a 27 kilometer hike on the Howitt spur track. Again, that looks pretty tough as well. I speculate that Niels took the 21 kilometer Stanley's name spur track. Now let's suppose he took that route. I haven't done it myself but reading up on it it requires a high level of fitness and high level of hiking experience because it is pretty tough and it's one of the most difficult grade hiking trails. If he'd have cleared the first kilometre which is the most difficult part of that trail he'd have continued on and perhaps set up camp for the night along the route and camped there on Saturday night. And then Sunday morning, he'd have continued on towards Mount Sterling on that route, perhaps camping at Mount Sterling on the Sunday night. This takes us to Sunday, the 27th of October. He's now got two days to get back to his car. Just remember, this is all speculation from now on because no one knows what happened. Niels had said that he was going to go to Mount Buller, possibly for skiing, possibly that's why he took his ski gear. And um, we can suppose that perhaps he spent Monday at Mount Buller and then camped out for the night. And then when he woke up on Tuesday, he could have taken the four mile spur Brocks Road track, which isn't awfully long. It's only about 10 kilometers, making his way back to the upper Jameson hut where his car was waiting for him. This is all my speculation only. No one actually knows his planned route at all. Well, I can't find it on the internet anywhere. So presume that is the case. What we do know is that he promised his parents he would stay safe and shelter in one of the many refuge huts in the area should his progress become compromised in any way, such as by weather, illness or injury. He sounds like a good lad so I'm sure he would have done had it been possible. We don't know if he got to Mount Sterling at all and it was very likely he didn't get to Mount Buller or at least not long enough to call his parents because remember he was supposed to call them from Mount Buller because communications would be better in that area because it's a very popular ski and mountain bike resort. Perhaps he skied in the area and got injured or lost attempting a steep off-piste downhill skiing section. His parents, Pia and Joanna and his sister Karen started to worry when they hadn't heard from him from Mount Buller on the Sunday or Monday. When they hadn't heard from him on the day he was due to leave the high country, they raised the alarm and reported him missing to the authorities. And that was on Tuesday, the 29th of October. First of all, his family were full of optimism that he'd soon be found. His sister writing on her Facebook profile that she thought Niels would emerge from the bush with some 
epic tale. She also said that Niels was strong and smart and they believed that he'd be using all his skills and experience to hang on until help arrives. The search commenced at 7am, either on the Wednesday the 30th or Thursday the 31st. I'm not sure which because there's conflict in reports on the internet, so I'd like to think it was on the Wednesday. More than 70 people, including police on the ground and in the air, with assistance from the SES, bush search and rescue, as well as volunteers, set out searching the huts and the trails. They had over 800 square kilometres of ground to cover, which would have been only part of his route by my calculations. If my speculation was correct, the uh, search route should have been even bigger. His family were proactive, asking for help via the media in a press conference on the Thursday, asking other hikers to report anything or anyone seen in that area at the time. Also asking other hikers if anyone knows of significant places or challenges in that area they would appreciate knowing, perhaps so they could search extra well in that area. Right now we are trying to think of what logic he might have used to stay safe, is what they said at the time. They also expressed their thanks to the search team saying, our admiration and thanks to the rescue teams. Niels was hiking and skiing in the area with treacherously steep rocky hillsides. To me, I think it's highly likely that he had fallen or lost control and fell into a deep ravine that had heavy bush cover. The senior sergeant overseeing the search operation was Damien Keegan. He had some theories. One was that Niels may have delayed his fourth day of the hike due to poor weather and then had to cram in extra kilometres. This could have meant Niels would be hiking at dusk or even in the dark and that isn't something you'd want to do with such steep ravines and this terrain. The search crews scoured the trails and the huts in and around Neil's proposed hiking area but poor weather had held them back a bit and remembering if it was frigid temperatures Neil's may have just been holding on until the rescue got there. Any hold-ups wasn't good for him. The police could find no clues at all and any reported sightings were soon discounted. Keegan was pretty much convinced that Niels hadn't completed the fourth day of his hike um, since there was phone signal at Mount Buller and he hadn't called, so he hadn't got to Mount Buller. If my speculation was correct, Niels would have been hiking the second half of the Stanley's name spur trail that day, which is known to be quite treacherous. The search continued for less than two weeks Keegan stating that he thought Niels would have succumbed to hypothermia by now or that he had even left the search area. But if he'd left the search area, I think he would have got out. For me, I don't buy that because if he was fit enough to leave the search area, he would have eventually got to civilization. There was also a report of him having crossed into New South Wales. But I don't buy that either because that's like a hundred kilometres at least to any of the parts of New South Wales as the crow flies. So a whole lot longer to hike. I, I just don't buy that at all. And if he had got to New South Wales, he'd have had to cross at least three surfaced roads where he could have been rescued. So I don't buy that one at all either. But please feel free to correct me if I'm missing something. The week after Niels disappeared, another hiker was in the area, Marty Felber, and he reported um, that the weather had been very unpredictable. One moment he was worried about the sunburn from the 20 degree heat, and within 20 minutes, while setting up his tent, the temperature had dropped 10 degrees, and by that night, it dropped another 10 degrees and it was hailing and snowing. Senior Sergeant Damien Keegan also said that he thought Niels had had an accident and that foul play wasn't involved. And I tend to agree with him. With the extreme temperatures at the time, an injury that incapacitated him would have meant hypothermia setting in very quickly. Sadly, to this day, Niels has never been found. 
and never re-emerged. We can speculate. Supposing he had a fall and was incapacitated, would a better telephone have helped him? Would a personal locator beacon have helped him? Would plotting his exact route and sending it to someone have helped him? Would hiking with other people have helped him? Well, we'll never know the answers to these questions. How incapacitated he was, possibly severely, then he may have been unconscious and succumbed to hypothermia before he even woke. So a phone or a PLB would be no use at all unless he managed to press the button or someone was tracking him. Had he been lucid and unable to get back on the trail, then yes, a PLB could certainly have helped him. I'm not sure about a better telephone because there isn't much coverage in those mountains, but possibly. If someone knew Neil's exact route, perhaps he would have been found by now for sure. If he'd have had friends with him, I speculate, yes, he would have survived, unless they all suffered the same fate. I am curious as to the method of navigation Niels was using. So if he didn't have a GPS device or a telephone that did um, navigation, then I'm thinking possibly he used a paper map and compass. As archaic as that is, very unlikely to get him totally lost he could have always headed on one bearing to get himself to safety. Niels may have even just walked off the trail for a bush poo and uh, either got lost or bitten by a snake because the snakes would be emerging from hibernation around that time. There's a remote chance he could have been struck by a four before. Unlikely but it is a possibility and that his body was removed from the area. It has happened before, as we know. Possibly Niels is alive and well somewhere. Wouldn't that be nice? But it can't be because he hasn't contacted his family and he was obviously very much a family guy and was said to be an absolutely fantastic uncle. So I can't see him not contacting his family, can you? Sadly, none of this speculation will help Niels or his family, but we can learn lessons from him and try and make sure it doesn't happen to us. And it certainly makes me aware that I must be better at plotting my routes and sending them to my daughter when I'm off out mountain biking and bike packing. Because I'm terrible at it. Sometimes I don't even tell her I've gone. So that's a lesson learned from Niels. My thoughts are with his parents and his sister, who to this day, nearly five years on, it'll be five years in two months' time, still have no closure. So my best wishes to them for finding Niels one day, someday, soon. If you were in the area or heard anything, heard some whispers, heard some gossip, put Peer, Joanna and Karen out of their misery and contact Crime Stoppers now on 1800 And that is the sad tale of Niels Becker. Story three, Damien McKenzie. I'm hiking uphill while reading this story, so please forgive me for being out of breath. I've got a story for you today. And this incident happened nearly 50 years ago on the 4th of September, 1974 at these very falls I'm walking to now. Now, 50 years ago, a group of girls and boys were at a bush camp in the town of Taggarty, 28 kilometers from Marysville. Now this group were bussed to the trailhead of Stevenson Falls. So all the children needed to do was hike the less than kilometer up the steep and winding track to have a view of the falls. Apparently, they were very well supervised. As they made their way up the hill, a 10-year-old boy, Damien McKenzie, started walking ahead of the group. Damien rounded a corner, and as the group rounded the corner, Damien was nowhere to be seen. They searched for him, they called him, but the supervisors soon realized that there was a problem and they quickly reported it to the authorities. And so began one of the largest searches in Australian history at the time. 
There was over 300 people looking for him. Searchers were drawn from many areas. The police, the Red Cross, local walking groups, the Forestry Commission and general citizens. All searched for him by foot, by water, using canines and from the air. Alas, after a week searching, Damien was still not found. And to this day, Damien has never been found. Could it have been an abduction? Was it animal predation? Did he fall into a disused mine shaft while dashing in the bush for a bush wee? Did he fall into the Stevenson River? Possibly he just popped off the trail to do a wee, got turned around and got lost in the bush. But why didn't they ever find his body? Could it be that he was abducted, reading up on it? It's very unlikely that someone could have abducted him um, and not be seen, but it's a possibility, I suppose. But I find it hard to believe that they were being well supervised if Damien could disappear. I would be pretty miffed if that was my son. Just like Celine, Celine Kramer, that I did a video on, she was walking to Philosopher Falls and disappeared, although she was alone. It was springtime when Damien went missing and the temperatures were quite frigid. So if he had injured himself in the bush, he would have soon become incapacitated by the cold. Divers searched the shallow, slow moving Stevenson River, where we are right now, just crossing, but nothing was found. Nothing was found in the bush and nothing was found in the water. It's very unlikely that Damien could have been abducted, but not impossible. If someone was waiting in the bush, it could have happened. I, I don't discount that at all myself. Apparently there are reports of Damien having been talking to someone in the car park, a stranger. He may have hiked ahead, waited in the bush. Strange that he abducted Damien you know, coincidence that Damien was ahead of everyone and that the man knew that was going to happen and abducted him, but not impossible. Animal predation. I think they'd have heard a noise and screaming, don't you? If it was a pack of dingoes or, or something like that. So I don't think that's an option. Now, if you were with a group of people and you wanted to nip in the bush, for a wee, you wouldn't go ahead, would you? Wouldn't you get behind? I'm not sure what's best, because then you'd be very behind. Perhaps he rushed ahead to make up some time so he could nip in the bush before everyone came and he could do a wee. It is said that any disused mine shafts had been filled in. I suppose there's a possibility one was missed or that the earth collapsed and he fell in but why wouldn't they have found it during the search with 300 people searching 30 square kilometers why wasn't Damien found I think it would be very difficult to get out of the 30 kilometer search range in a short period of time um, because it is very dense since that fateful day the case has never been closed and in fact an ex-police officer and Stephen's brother, who is also in law enforcement, have kept on searching and kept on investigating. The retired detective, Valentine Smith, he met Damien's brother, Stephen, on Crime Stoppers. And together, they are still trying to find out what happened to Stephen's brother, Damien. Sadly, Damien's parents died without ever knowing what happened to him. That's so, so terribly sad. I just can't imagine what they went through. Absolutely awful. So let's hope Valentine and Stephen get some new leads and solve the case of the disappearance of Damien McKenzie.
Story 4, Celine Cremere. At the end of the original recording, I have an update on Celine for you, which is very interesting. Celine has been touring Tasmania for six months. She was just coming to the end of her time in Tasmania. Her family reported her missing on Monday the 26th of June, as they hadn't heard from her since Friday the 16th of June. Currently, at 10 p.m. on the 2nd of July, her whereabouts still is not known, sadly. And let me be clear, I'm not saying her disappearance is due to the trail being poorly marked, but it is a possibility. She was due to leave Tasmania on the Spirit of Tasmania ferry, returning to the mainland on Wednesday the 21st of June. Alas, she didn't make that sailing. Police found a Honda CRV car in the Philosopher Falls car park on Tuesday the 27th of June, the day after she was reported as missing. The ferry terminal at Devonport is approximately 120 kilometres away from Philosopher Falls, so possibly she was making that her last little tourist spot before she got back to the mainland. I'm unsure of who saw her, but she was known to be in the township of Waratah, a mining town 10 kilometres from Philosopher Falls, and that was on Friday the 17th of June. The last reported ping from her phone was in the vicinity of Philosopher Falls on Tuesday the 20th of June. That makes it 12 days as of today that her whereabouts has been unknown. In case you don't know, Tasmania is an island state of Australia. It sits 240 kilometres south from the mainland. The Philosopher Falls walking track is an out and back, approximately two kilometres out, two kilometres back. In total, you gain around 100 metres in elevation on top of the approximately 600 metres elevation that the site is at. Apparently the walk to the falls is absolutely beautiful and it's a well laid out track through rainforest. To get to the waterfall though, you need to turn off the track and negotiate some steep downhill steps of which there are over 200 of them. So it's quite a climb down. The weather in Tasmania is renowned for the constant rain. Over the past week, it has seen rain, snow and freezing temperatures. Today, during the day, it was a feels like 3.3 degrees Celsius, so quite cold. I haven't done this hike myself, but I've read some reviews of the hike and I noticed two things. Firstly, is that a highly experienced hiker made a mistake in 2021 where he thought he had got onto the waterfalls trail from the car park only to realise some way in that it couldn't possibly be the trail because the bush was so dense. He'd been following some pink ticker tape on the foliage, but decided to return to the car park and seek out the correct trailhead, which he did. Secondly, I noticed that one hiker's review says, make sure you turn left to the viewing area down the steps and don't go straight ahead as he didn't know where it leads. Looking at the terrain on the map, it leads to a very steep gully. Also on another hiker's review, looking at the recorded GPS route, he did go straight by the steps and continued on, but then turned back. He must have realized he'd missed it. So for me, there is more than one possibility of taking the wrong route or diverting from the correct route. Certainly if it was me, I'd likely to be making at least one, if not both, of those mistakes. Celine's a Belgian national, she's French speaking, she has long blonde hair, she's 31 years old. I'll end my original recording of my coverage of Celine's case there because I have some new information. A Tasmanian conservationist by the name of Ted Mead has been doing his own investigations into her disappearance and has been searching for Celine but he complains that the police won't provide him or haven't provided him with all the information. Celine's family did hire a private detective and he did get some information from the police 
and he did get the information of where her phone had last pinged. Now where I speculated that possibly Celine walked straight past the falls and continued on, seems that this could be a strong possibility of what actually happened because her phone did ping in two places north of the falls. The car park is south of the falls. Now if you look at the map on the screen, the yellow line is the trail from the car park to the falls. The pink uh, dashes are a possible route she may have taken and the two phone pings are showing in yellow. If it is true that her phone pinged in these two positions, I cannot understand why she hasn't been found yet when they have a better indication of where she was. Some of the bush there is extremely dense. I know it would be hard to search, but this is 14 months on. And so there are four disappearance stories for you. Three yet to be resolved, one relatively quickly resolved which was good news and great luck for Rory. What a lucky man Rory was. I'm so glad he was found. He doesn't seem to have released his story as to what actually happened. Did he just go for a bushwee and fell down the cliff? Was he taking a photograph and fell down the cliff? We don't know. Or was it something a little more sinister? Perhaps one day the story will be told. But I will close this video here. So until next time, it's a goodbye for now. And thank you so much for watching. My thoughts are with the families and loved ones of those still missing and with those that have gone missing. Thank you so much for being with me today. If you found this interesting, perhaps you could signify that by hitting the like button. That would be fantastic and thank you very much.